So, uh, Shadi, can you uh, explain a bit what you wanted to talk about, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I ran through this quickly last night in anticipation that maybe I might have to record it, but um, so it should be about 10, 15 minutes and time to discuss afterwards. Uh, let me see. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So I'll be talking today about uh, what I've discovered as the, what, I, what I've discovered in my research as what could potentially be uh, a standard decentralized science stack. Um, so hello for everyone that just joined in. I think um, one of the Google Summer Code scholars just hopped in. Hello, thanks for hopping in. And um, yeah, so it's been really you know, exciting for me as a trainee to come into the field of neuroimaging you know, around the time of you know, about 2013, 2014, and really see how uh, this community of you know, the hackathon has, has grown and developed and you know, everything since Cameron's first hackathon, which she modeled after uh, uh, another global global hackathon, and um, kind of you know really seeing how you know in the beginning it was really really centralized, and there was one source of kind of organization, and you know it was like the hackathon, and then now we have hackathons all over the world, which is pretty cool, and um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the different. Uh, technological and software and uh, different community building tools that we could use to really flesh out the decentralized nature of Hackathon. And even um, with this lofty, ambitious goal of building an autonomous, self-sustaining, decentralized science organization that has the ability to curate funding, crowdsource funds, um, uh, curate grants and so on and so forth. So that I think that definitely is off a little bit in the future, but um, some of the other technology is here and I think would be really interesting. So when I think when I think about uh, the hackathon, I'm thinking about really it's a citizen science community. It's pretty much all inclusive. You don't have to have a PhD or um, you don't have to have some special training to participate. It's uh, these, you know, very, you know, sometimes very specific, other times very general problems have anything to do from social issues to, you know, solving a pull request in an open repository. And they have the nature of being globally distributed where everybody, like, hello, you know, I'm here, uh, and anyone everywhere can work no, regardless of, 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 you know, who, you know, what their country is or what their identity is. Um, and what's super interesting, too, is that a lot of the um, the codes, the code of conduct, the regulations of, you know, when and what and how to do things, these are all community governed and nothing is set in stone, um, which makes it really powerful and flexible and adaptable to, uh, you know, tailor individual hackathons that sp uh, spread up to specific uh, problems. And of course, uh, we really embrace opening, openness, inclusivity and transparency. Um, and through this, we're able to really crowdsource problem solving by putting all of the necessary tools out there, um, making the conversations public, making the learning materials public. And it's not a competition. It's not who can solve the problem the fastest, but it's how can we uplift ourselves as a community um, to and, and coordinate around really challenging scientific problems, right? So, uh, you know, I believe that uh, a lot of the things that we've done, been able to do so far, a lot of the amazing achievements of the hackathon community have been powered by innovations in the web, right? Like GitHub, where would we be without that? Um, and so I think that there's more stuff coming and we should start thinking about them. Um, so I wanna really quickly go through, not in too much detail, but just enough to get these ideas out there and everyone to start thinking about them and happy to discuss more afterwards. Uh, so I think of the DSI stack as uh, a stack of maybe five core, um, uh, I guess, technologies. The first would be the ability to store data, data uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So, you know, it'll be very difficult for us to guarantee openness or open data or um, open accessibility to scientific problems if it's always stored in these centralized servers. Like for example, if you want to work with the ABCD data set that's collected here in the United States, it's open access, but there's a series of steps that you need to go through, uh, almost always through an institution. Uh, and there's good reasons for that as well uh, to access that data. Um, and you know, in, in, in many cases, if you know there's some sort of issue with any sort of centralized uh, source of failure, then um, 
oops, sorry. Uh, if there's any centralized source of failure, then you know that data might be gone or lost. And there's all sorts of other issues too regarding bandwidth of you know downloading a file from one place or whatnot. Anyway, maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later in the next slide. Uh, another really in, uh, important component of the DSI stack would be uh, the self-sovereign identity management where uh, individuals hold their own data, they manage the permissions, they decide to opt in or opt out. And that's the topic of our hackathon today to think about how the bit standard could um, co-integrate with the existing worldwide web, worldwide web consortium specification for DID. Uh, the next kind of natural extension of that is this idea of confidential and federated cloud computing, right? Where you host the data uh, either locally or on a encrypted in a peer-to-peer -peer network where the hashes are known to um, to the holder of that data set, the owner of that data set. And where if I, as a um, Alzheimer commercial researcher wants to use someone's data to you know, generate some insight or perform some computation, um, I would request that data. It would be made available in a secure encrypted cloud session, uh, maybe run by a K8 cluster, something similar. And, um, computation would occur in that session and I would be able to receive the derivatives of that analysis or the results of the analysis, but the data never leaves, you know, it, it never leaves the ownership or the stewardship of the owner, um, which I think is really powerful. And um, maybe, and this is not maybe appropriate for all cases where we need to work with raw data, right? Like, you know, say you're a scientist collecting raw data from the scanner, um, you might need to manipulate that raw data and, you know, you know manually curate it. But uh, in the case of, in the case of um, you know people just pulling free surfer reconstructions, that's a different story, uh, or the products of a bids app. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so and I think like a lot of scientific innovation really translates into generating economic value, and in often cases, a lot of scientific innovation occurs within institutions. It uses institutional resources, and the way that that economic value is later on distributed is it's within that institution and it goes according to that to that hierarchy, right? Like who gets the payouts first? And there is technology out there that lets us set up data marketplaces where um, every query to a data set or every query to a compute session um, is, is an exchange of information and by definition is also an exchange of economic value. And so you could start thinking about how we could build uh, bylaws or smart contracts that ensure common goods where there's some tax or some um, fee that's taken out and put into a public treasury that's open and transparent and is governed by community about how to disperse for future grants or funding for travel or things like that. So uh, really quickly, I just want to introduce everyone to IPFS. If you haven't heard about it yet, it is the Interplanetary File System. And uh, the reason why it's called that will be really clear in a second. Uh, it's a really kind of simple, almost, uh, 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 solution to the problem of storing a file. So right now we rely on hypertext transfer pro uh, things protocol, right? Um, where we have a central server. And, and everyone has a portal on their computer and then they enter some you know, legally accepted string that follows some, 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 some qualifier that allows them to access a particular URL or a particular um, you know, page on the internet. And you can do things with that, uh, execute methods on that, such as download the file or um, execute some code remotely. Uh, the difference with IPFS is that data isn't stored in a single place. It's, stored first off by the first person who uploads it. And then whenever someone pulls that data set or that piece of information, they also become both a data consumer and also become a seeder at the same time. So it's this natural way of growing um, a storage network where data is only stored if it's used and it's popular. Um, and there's different ways of setting up these different types of clusters. You could set up like a federated IPFS cluster, right? So there's the public one, and it has some pretty cool stuff, right? I think all the, the entire archive um, preprint database is on IPFS. Um, so IPFS is kind of like, it's really interesting. It's, it's like a combination between Git, Git version control and uh, a blockchain. So it's, um, it's, the, it's a universal file structure that's shared by everyone running the, the software. And the Merkle tree is what gives it immutability or makes it like a blockchain because there's a cryptographic hash that's stored um, within each 
um, within each instance of a data set being pulled or uh, copied or disseminated. And that hash is then per perpetuated into the next copy. And if there's any variations that happen along the way, then that hash changes. Um, and so you can always be guaranteed that data is, con is, is the content that you're looking for is what it is. Unlike with the HTTP system, you could potentially click on a link and get some malware or some bad data. So it's content addressable, it's mutable, and it follows uh, the structure as a directed acyclic graph. So kind of how a GitHub repository works where you have some initial commit and you're constantly moving, building off to the right, you can branch off, right? Uh, so this allows us to also build uh, different versions of, of a data set as well. Um, and the, the providence is maintained and kept in this database of links. Uh, that link you to where the file should be stored on a computer. So if you look at uh, a, uh, an IPFS link, it's, um, you know, there's going to be the gateway that you'll go through. Uh, so this is the public gateway. Some browsers now already have it uh, automatically built in. So I think Brave and Opera browsers, now you can just type in IPFS colon um, and then the hash. And so this is the hash that's assigned to your, to your file when you upload it into uh, the IPFS. And so this is for the paper. If you're curious, you can go read more about it. OK, I am blocking my slides with all your beautiful faces. OK, let's see. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so the next kind of topic building off of this naturally as part of the decentralized science stack is this concept of self-sovereign and decentralized identity. Um, the way that they generally work, or at least that's the specification that's been um, that's been finalized in, I would say mostly finalized by the World Web, Wide Web Consortium, the DID standard is, uh, so you have this um, universal schema uh, for DID where there's some, you know, there's DID that indicates that's what it is. And then there's a namespace uh, for the methods that you would implement on that particular DID and then uh, a label. And so the identifier is assigned uh, to a particular entity um, and that identifier is literally, it's like, um, it's like a data lab alias or data lab alias, or like it's a, it's a pointer to a document um, or uh, a DDO is what was what it's called. And so you can verify identity by having a DID that contains a pointer to documents like a brain scan or personal information or claims um, uh, about, you know, whether they want to pull their data or not. And you can verify identity by having a third party like an institution or a brain imaging center uh, uh, verify, you know, assign a DID, the person signs their data set, and then the external third party, such as a brain imager, also verifies that data set, adding their signature to it. And over time, you can build a strong uh, identity, um, uh, decentralized identity, uh, uh, I guess, like fingerprint, right? Um, but at the same time, your identity is maintained um, within, uh, depending on how you set it up, like for example, if you use the identity index or the three box uh, solutions, you're, I, you decide what you make public. You decide what's visible and what's not visible through encryption. Um, so yeah, so I can talk more about this, but I wanna get to the other ones. Um, I spoke a little bit about compute to data, um, mostly the, most of these solutions, I think, are uh, available through Ocean, which has built uh, an entire Python stack for uh, tokenizing a data set uh, so that, you know, having pointers that point to IPFS distributed data sets. And then having uh, an, uh, a nice little CLI that lets you call a Kubernetes uh, KA cluster to come operate on the data, check the permissions, check what the uses, uh, the use rights are. Uh, and then returning those data derivatives back to the person who called uh, the function. Uh, Ocean's also, uh, their primary sort of, I think, method or their primary sort of, um, I guess, innovation is uh, building data marketplaces. So places where you can have, um, like it's really hard to value data or what it should cost. Um, so you can have these automated market makers for data sets um, that could be stored on IPFS, for example, and where, where, where um, uh, the simple act of pulling a data set out of a, a pool of data uh, that might be backed with some 
perhaps collateral such as a governance token for a DAO or such as maybe US dollars, for example, uh, when you pull that out, it would automatically change the price. And so it allows you to uh, set like a, a natural price discovery curve for any really digital asset. So pretty interesting. Um, I think the most powerful potential for this is the ability to allow people to share their data while mitigating concerns of privacy. Uh, and last but not least, I think the, you know, we have, you know, so, all right, so what do we, what did we talk about so far? We talked about uh, the ability to store files in a distributed uh, manner uh, securely. We talked about um, uh, identity management. So being able to manage the permissions for that data and ensuring that uh, people are who they say they are and, um, and being able to ensure privacy. And then we talked about how we would perform computation on data distributed in these networks. So the thing that's missing next after that, right? So we have all these basic tools, but what's really missing is um, uh, a community wrapper, right? A digital community wrapper around that, or what's called the DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, where the bylaws of the organization are enshrined in code and any modifications to that code have to be um, performed by those that hold the tokens for that DAO. And agreements are executable by these smart contracts, which such, such as, for example, a DAO could form around the idea that um, every single exchange of information should be for the common good or should be for making data more available or should be for furthering scientific research projects that best benefit uh, the community or the world. And so, allowing for profit sharing and common goods to, to take place and being able to fund uh, the perpetual accessibility of different data sets uh, by making sure that they're, all, they're, they're always hosted or the computational resources are always available for those that uh, would like to request them. Uh, yeah, so if you want to learn a little bit more, uh, help figure out how to build some of this stuff or just to talk about it and pros and cons and um, where it might be going and what we need to watch out for and other interesting things, you can join us on our Discord. Uh, you can also vis visit us on our GitHub to see what active projects we have going on. Um, we have a couple other things. We have uh, a project that should be going out in the Brain Hack proceedings very shortly on uh, updating Git Annex with IPFS. So like if you've ever used uh, Git Annex to manage databases, um, version control databases, you can always add special remotes that let you go to Google Cloud or to Dropbox. Uh, so there is a uh, IPFS script, but it doesn't really work well. <laughs> so um, we want to make that work well and eventually integrate it with Datalad uh, so that you can pull and push to a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer storage network um, and be able to decide whether it's, you know, whether it's like a consortium of institutions that are sharing this data or whether it's a public gateway. Um, and so that's one project we have going on and a couple others. So feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more. And I hope I didn't go too long. Sorry, I'm trying to quit. Um, there we go. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Do we have questions? Um, I have a question. But uh, if someone else wants to go first, let's do that. If I see any hands, I don't see any hands. Um, so, so all of this, so I find it quite interesting. Uh, lo lots of it I don't understand. Um, and I'm guessing like w for people without a technical background, there's a lot of aspects of this that in general, sounds like it, it could drive science forward in the way that we want, but you don't really know how, like at, at, at what point or at which level you can be involved in something like this. Because if it's if it's purely people who are familiar with uh, security and figuring out how to make these decentralized networks communicate, um, it's a very small subgroup of people that that know how to discuss these things in, a, in an open forum. So how, and perhaps this relates actually quite well to the other topic that we haven't put on, on us in our conference, but how do, how, how do we get involved in, in something like this? If we think like decentralized science as a, as a concept 
is a good thing and we want to we want to help but how how do we actually contribute or benefit from it or get involved in in a way that would not require those types of skills that i just uh, summarized yeah that's an excellent that's an excellent question i think the most important one because um you don't have decentralized science without community you don't have um you know, you, you don't have, you don't have it. You don't have it if you don't have people that feel completely able to contribute and to, um, you know, to actually build, build this sort of um, organization. So I would say that many of the challenges are technical in nature. There are um, still problems to be solved regarding uh, the ability of files to be available on IPFS, the ability, um, to call adequate cl cloud resources, for example, there's a lot of coding to be done. But I think the most important thing is really establishing a community vision for what sort of rules or universal ideas that a decentralized global science community would look like. Um, and of course, it could just be a neuroscience community of brain hackers to begin with, but we can think a little bit big. Um, just when, as we're building our tools, because maybe other people might use them as well. So I definitely, I don't think I have uh, <laughs> the wherewithal to be able to really um, say what that should be in authority, right? That's not something I can decide. Um, but having and circulating a series of documents that um, kind of codify what a decentralized science community should look like, what we should, you know, which rules we should respect, which um, concepts and ethos we want to uphold and perpetuate in society. Um, and then I think, you know, I, you know, the, the coders are out there, the people who work in this field are, you know, are going to work on it. And I think once we have that vision, and it's very clearly something that's uh, arrived at by consensus by a diverse community, I think that's the best way to move forward. Uh, so right now I'm just kind of, I'm like, oh, this is a really cool idea. Let's see what happens. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to throw it out there and see, see what you guys think. And um, yeah, I'm more than happy to, to, you know, uh, hold on to the flag, carry it forward and pass it on. Yeah. And do you know if there are already communities that are operating on that level? Um, so not on the technical aspects of like names of groups and people that, that we could uh, contact and reach out to and, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I have um. So you got to go check out um, Aragon. Aragon is uh, building basically a one-stop shop for creating DAOs. Um, there's definitely a lot more to work out. It's basically like it's like if Meetup.com met the engineers of GitHub. <laughs> so where you can create a club that's governed by rules and has that's. Uh, that's you know running on code pretty much, and you can modify and extend that code, and you can plug and play it with other really exciting things like um, like you know things to manage your treasury. Uh, plug it into you know you know for example, if you wanted to advertise uh, particular things and do so in a rules based manner, uh, where you're drawing from the treasury, you know once a month to advertise a hackathon or something. Um, uh, so that I think that's pretty cool. And then there's also something called Deep DAO. Uh, which is a list of all of the different DAOs that have been formed. And believe it or not, most of them are all financial in nature, most of them, um, where people are kind of crowdsourcing funds, like as these like new age community hedge funds, like some sort of Wall Street bets sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think it's just a financial instrument. I think it's an instrument of human coordination. Um, and you see that in some of these networks that have become like flavors, right? They have their own culture, uh, like PyDAO, for example, or Avagachi, uh, or Metacartel, or Moloch, for example. These guys are a huge funder of public goods in the space. Um, yeah, and so there's different examples out there. You know, it, to get started with this, I would just Google what is a DAO, or, you know, I have some links in our Discord group, in our read feed, and you can just go through those and it, it'll, um, it'll uh, you know, you can read about it and, and learn more. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, perhaps I uh, also would like to um, to just follow up on this. Uh, so, Shadi, is that the way, nice way to correct me to uh, pronounce it? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, my mama calls me Shadi. Shadi, okay, Shadi. Um, so um, thank you very much for this uh, for this introduction. I was um, not aware of the uh, DAO. I think uh, many of us weren't. Um, actually, I, I really like the concept because well, I'm working in AI. Um, and the, the main struggle that we at this point have is, uh, and actually I encountered it quite recently, is that you want to combine data. You don't really have to, or you don't really uh, want to keep it. That's not your rationale, in, 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 not in any way. You just want to use it to train a model. Um, and that's, of course, the whole idea behind federated learning. Um, and my question was, is there some kind of uh, gateway in how you can set these systems up? Because for example, um, it, it, we have a lot of hospitals that we work with. We have a very good will, but of course there are boundaries. It's just uh, a lot of patient data going on there. And it's, uh, and right now it's some kind, sometimes it feels like between papers and between um, a research group that it's just a battle for the biggest data set that you can model upon. And in, in my, opinion that still feels incorrect because it should be the one that models the most create uh, most creatively and the, the best that one should win in that sense uh, instead of the one having the biggest data set and that's yeah just curious about your opinion yeah no that's that's really interesting like um i went to a really really good talk a couple months ago on um the reproducibility crisis in machine learning and uh, this one individual, um, I can't remember his name exactly. I can uh, write it in the chat. Uh, he, he dedicated 20 years of his, of his research to building automated pipelines for reproducing existing machine learning papers. And what he found was, all right, you know, great. You have these you know, data sets and these groups that are working with massive data sets to try to predict different problems, or, you, know, you know, solve problems by making predictions about health or whatever. And sure they work in that one paper sure they use 20,000 patients data and they executed it and they got you know an r squared of 0.9 or something um but the the majority of papers that he tested i think he went through 500 um machine learning papers with large data sets and the majority of them all fail to replicate in the real world and you know the problem wasn't really so much as um you know, how big their data set was or how correct or incorrect their model was. Uh, there's just so many other steps along the way that if you don't know how they went from that specific library that they depended on and how they compiled it to, you know, which uh, operating system that they used some intermediate data set on and, and so on and so forth. So he found like a whole list of problems and he has, I think it's called cknowledge.io uh, where you can find uh, reusable workflows and use his technology to try to reproduce different aspects of uh, existing papers. And he also came up with this idea too of uh, a living research paper where a research paper when published is never done. It's never, you know, you publish it and that's it, that's the solution. Um, a living research paper is one where you are actively as a community coming to consensus about how to update it and update the knowledge, kind of like Wikipedia actually. So not completely novel. Well, that's, that's something that's really nice that you, that you mentioned. I don't know, <clears throat> uh, I was clinically trained. Um, I don't know if you were aware of the Cochrane community. Uh, mm -hmm. So Cochrane is a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, uh, perhaps uh, I, can, I can just post it in the chat. Cochrane. If you Google that, you know, Cochrane is, um, it's, it's basically the same. Every four to five years, you get a request to update your uh, systematic review because otherwise it got outdated. <laughs> but it's yeah, essentially, so uh, that could be a burden or a virtue, <laughs> whatever you look at it. Um, but the, the idea is nice. And I, I just uh, want to add upon the idea that you just uh, nudged because I think that's indeed quite quite nice it's it's actually never done if there's more data and you want to retrain your data you want to retrain your model and or, or there's other data you also want to actually somehow have uh, uh, yeah have that in that paper or that living paper how you uh, call it yeah yeah so how do we you know incentivize people to publish data so that it's interoperable right where you know and you know bits is a great living like i can you know game theoretic experiment of how the you know the neuroscience community is um 
slowly converging on standards for data interoperability where you know I can publish a data set and somebody else can and you can combine those and to some fair degree of confidence know that you can put them together to you know if they meet your qualifiers and filters uh, that you can use them for your pipelines to answer your question um, and yeah it's just been really interesting in my own experience because uh, you know I was when I first started my PhD uh, back in 2013 and then defending last year you know, bids didn't exist. And just kind of seeing how much that changed uh, just the research pipeline. And then, you know, witnessing, you know, the young trainees kind of being like, oh, we got to use this. And then the older, more entrenched interests being like, oh, I don't know, we got to redo the database. Um, and then how over time those obstacles were um, as, as the value proposition of bids really kind of rang true. Um, so yeah, I just also wanted to point to your other uh, comment or to your other question about kind of like um, how, you know, how, would, how we would do this in a general way where it's not just, you know, bids is one thing, but how do we think about data interoperability in a larger sense? And I think the Ocean Protocol has done a great job. They've been working on this problem since I think like 2018 or 2019, uh, not that long, but uh, it's, it's a fresh idea. And I think they were the first ones uh, really in on it. Uh, and so they, they kind of, you know, just take a look at that blog post and they really, and there's a whole series of these blog posts you can read through if you're interested mm -hmm. They talk about just um, like, how would you think um, like on an agent basis, what are the different agents in a data marketplace and who, um, and what are the best ways to align incentives and to also ensure availability um, and how to build the pipelines for all of that. Um, yeah, I think it's really powerful too, once you, um, oh, cool, we got some other questions. I think it's really powerful too, once you combine it with, with IPFS, because then anybody could publish data and you know, through Ocean, you can have pointers to DDOs to distributed document objects. And um, uh, yeah, and then you, know, you, can, you can run through, through these pipelines and assemble data, uh, machine learning data sets on the fly. Um, mm -hmm. So feel free to take a look at that. So I'm also still learning about it. So uh, feel free if you ever, you know, uh, to reach out if you, know, you wanna talk about something new that you found out. Great, thanks.